Hello and welcome everyone. Welcome back. This is the second interval of the third Applied Active Inference Symposium at the Active Inference Institute on August 22nd, 2023. This is going to be another packed and exciting interval, and we're kicking it off with Jean-Francois Cloutier, a collective of theorizers, first steps. So JF, thank you for joining and to you for this presentation. And if anybody has questions for this presentation or any of the others, please just put it in the live chat and I'll do it. I can. So thanks JF to you. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Daniel. Um, I'm a software engineer at a, a company called smart rent, where I write software for smart home systems. Um, I also work on a research project at the Active Inference Institute uh, called the Robotics and Embodied uh, Project. My uh, current focus is on supervised learning in active inference agents. In my presentation today, which is titled A Collective of Theorizers for Steps, um, I'll first start with a, a brief recap of the project, then dive into um, recent progress. And then I'll conclude with uh, what I see as the next steps of the project. Well, since 2017, I've been experimenting with uh, Lego robots and um, models of cognition. I do this uh, uh, for my own education because, uh, like I think most of us, I understand something better when I build it. Um, what you see here is the uh, my latest uh, robot model. It, it's a rover. It has a whole bunch of sensors and a, a number of uh, effectors, actuators. Um, as a matter of fact, those sensors and actuators can be understood as forming the Markov blanket of uh, my uh, robot. Last year, <clears throat> I presented at the symposium about the history of the project its uh, then status and um, its ambitions. I presented a cognitive model that implemented predictive processing from an active inference perspective. So there were uh, generative models, there was predictions, there was prediction errors. And um, the, these generative models animated the robots so that they would roam, uh, avoid obstacles, uh, observe their uh, companion, and also, in a very simplistic way, build a, a theory of mind of the uh, other robot. They could, uh, uh, from observations, um, infer that the, uh, the other robot had detected food, food being presented here as a, a sheet of paper on, on the floor, and then would uh, kind of try to track the other robot to also get to the food. And, and fun stuff like this. Um, the implementation. Uh, combined uh, uh, multi-processing and functional computing. There was nothing probabilistic in the implementation. I thought maybe we'd uh, see them in action. This was presented last year, but just to get a sense of uh, what they do. I have two robots here, um, one uh, named Carl and Andy. I, I named them before I knew I was gonna present at the conference. Um, so uh, they, benefited from a, a number of training sessions. They uh, learned how to um, uh, find which policies would achieve their goals better than others. And uh, one here on the left uh, found the food rather uh, right away, but uh, got closer to the pedestal uh, where the beacon is that simulates the scent of food. Um, feared was getting into a collision and then backs off in a hurry, as we'll see. The other robot observes all this, sees the other, the, the, the robot backing off as being in a panic and uh, decides to share in, in, in this emotion and uh, backs up as well. So, you know, uh, fun stuff. The um, since from, from the beginning, I've um, implemented different cognition models, but they all have in common the fact that they implement a society of mind. 
Um, so what is a society of mind? A society of mind is uh, a concept by which um, the, uh, the, the mind is not a monolithic uh, structure, but a composition of simple actors, independent actors that interact with each other in simple ways. That uh, view of the mind was put forth by, by Marvin Minsky um, 50 years ago. So this is not recent. Again, <clears throat> what I presented last year was a society of mind containing a hierarchy of, I call them cognition actors. Each cognition actor is an independent process. Each one has a scope, um, a level of abstraction as well. So for example, you would have a cognition actor that's concerned with the location of food and uh, it would have beliefs and perceptions about food location. And these would feed into a higher level cognition actor, let's say food approach, which is concerned about getting closer to the food and so forth and so on. These cognition actors communicate again in simple ways. This is a society of mind. And they communicate by emitting predictions, predictions about the beliefs of other cognition actors. And they communicate by emitting prediction errors when predictions made about their beliefs by others uh, are inaccurate. That leads to uh, uh, cognition actors processing these uh, uh, prediction errors and combining them with their own predictions to uh, create a, um, an updated uh, set of perceptions that are uh, synthesized into beliefs. And these beliefs lead to um, actions in order to eliminate uh, negative beliefs and val or validate positive beliefs. Now, it's from the interactions of all these uh, cognition actors that seemingly purposeful uh, behaviors emerge. So that was successful, but learning was very limited. This, um, this uh, hierarchy uh, of uh, cognition actors uh, was given, was predefined. And the only learning that um, a robot would, would do was to discover which um, action policies tended to um, be more effective. So clearly, my robots are not monolithic um, active inference agents. Um, and so the, the question is, why would I uh, use a society of mind architecture well, because I, I subscribe uh, to the uh, notion that all intelligence is collective intelligence. And, and this paper uh, makes uh, the, the argument uh, quite cogently. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna cite a number of papers which uh, were um, uh, important to the evolution of my thinking. This is one of them. Uh, this paper sees intelligence as a process uh, not a property. It's a process enacted by the uh, interacting parts, uh, as opposed to, again, uh, a property of individuals. So a uh, society of mind is basically that. It's, a, it's actually a, um, a number of interacting processes um, that together, from which emerge uh, apparently intelligent behaviors. Now, my, my own personal current definition of intelligence is uh, self-sustaining, an active sense-making, sense-making is really important, by autonomous agent as system in a dissipative and dynamic environment. And this guides um, all the work I do in uh, this project. Now, if you want a um, description, a detailed description of uh, uh, where my project stood at the uh, a year ago, there's a, a paper that uh, was published that I published on uh, Zinodo, which you can uh, look up. Now, over the last year, I wanted to move away from a pre-built, a given society of mind, and toward a learned society of mind. I wanted to see if. Um, I could program an autonomous robot to evolve 
its society of mind through its interactions with uh, its environment. Now, one might think that programming uh, autonomy is an oxymoron. Um, it's, 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 it's a, would be a good point, but I don't think it is. Um, if, if the program I write and, and install my robots uh, imparts uh, constitutive autonomy, which is uh, uh, enable the robot to constitute its own identity, and if it imparts adaptivity, which uh, enable the robot to uh, modify itself from its interactions with the environment, then I think that um, uh, the the robot uh, will be truly autonomous. Now, for uh, autonomy to um, to exist inherently in the robot, something in the robot must be at stake. And in it's definitely it's in this case it's the survival of the robot's society of mind. Now, the physical structure of the robot is not uh, at stake. Its, its survival is not at stake unless, of course, it falls off a shelf. But as I intend to um, have my robot develop its society of mind from experiences, I also expect that if it fails, that this society of mind will perish in its attempt to to grow and, and sustain itself so that's what's at stake in in in, in this current and in, in going forward in this project is the robots survive the survival of the robot society of mind and and this survival would be an, an, an expression of being by doing uh, the robot need will need to act and interact in its environment in order to uh, survive now Whatever sense it's going to make of its environment will then be grounded in this uh, survival imperative. Uh, in essence, the uh, robot society of mine will have skin in the game. If this weren't the case, then sense making would actually reside somewhere else. It would reside in in in, in the mind of the of the programmer. In my mind, as I observe uh, the, the robots, but I would like the sense making to be grounded in the survival of the robot's mind itself. So that's key. Now, what do I mean by an evolving and growing uh, society of mind? So instead of the given society of mind, which I, I showed uh, earlier, I want um, I want the cognition actors to uh, be created to uh, connect with each other dynamically through interactions with the environment. Um, so I want an, an active, uh, self-organizing, self-optimizing collective of cognition actors. Now, is this feasible? Uh, well, that's a big question. Um, in, in order to, in, in trying to answer this question, uh, I'll be um, also answering uh, questions like, what must be given a priori and what can be discovered? Well, I already have elements uh, of an answer. I know that the, um, the sensors and the uh, effectors and the um, the cognition the primitive cognition actors that wrap them will be given this this will be like what you're born with basically and there might be a um, a metacognition actor which uh, role will be to uh, oversee and guide the evolution of uh, all other cognition actors but that's that's my hypothesis I can imagine a test environment for uh, my robot that will uh, test its ability to survive. I can imagine, for example, that um, as the, the robot uh, moves around uh, or computes, it, it, it uh, uses a limited store of energy, it's simulated, and that uh, store of energy is replenished when the robot um, consumes food, and that would be by being on top of uh, uh, pieces of paper, colored pieces of paper on the floor. Um, and I'm going to make sure that it needs two sources of food in order to survive. Like right? That would be represented by a yellow paper and a green paper, for example, so that to prevent the, the, the robot from just simply finding one, one source of food and just stationing itself over it. So it, it, the environment will also contain obstacles. So the robot will need to learn how to navigate, uh, avoid obstacles, locate different sources of food, uh, get to them, and make sure that it, it, it 
uh, alternate between various uh, sources of food in order to survive. And the um, society of mind that will evolve will uh, hopefully um, evolve to uh, successfully do this. Else, if it doesn't, then it will um, shrink as resources uh, disappear and uh, essentially uh, die. So that's what's at stake uh, for uh, this robot. Now, this effort employs a, a number of frameworks. Um, and by framework, I mean a, a useful system of concept and constraints that, that, that guide uh, the implementation. Well, there's obviously the, the, the free energy principle and the active inference uh, framework. Um, however, I see this, the, I see active inference uh, as an as if framework. It describes the what, what must be achieved. In, in this case, uh, a reduction of uh, the agent's uh, variational free energy. But it doesn't guide me as to the implementation, how to build the robot. For this, um, I need as is frameworks. And um, I'll be using uh, two frameworks. One, which I've been using since uh, the beginning of the project, which is uh, the actor model. Uh, the actor model uh, views computation as um, uh, a diversity of processes, processes that are independent, have their own private internal state, and who communicate with one another strictly through messages. Um, yesterday in uh, interval one, uh, Keith Duggar uh, presented on the actor model and um, made the case that we should use the actor model to implement active inference agents. Well, I wholeheartedly agree with them. The uh, other uh, framework that I'm going to be using is uh, a special case of symbolic AI called the Apperception Engine. And much of the presentation will be about uh, the Apperception Engine and its implementation. So here's where we are. Uh, is the project is located at the intersection of um, active inference as a domain, the what, and society of mind as a, an architecture and symbolic AI as a form of computing. Um, so that's where uh, the project is at this intersection. Now, so where to begin? So I, I want to um, uh, dive into um, a more extensive form of learning. And the first step, uh, logically, is to learn how to predict. So um, I want to um, enable a single uh, cognition actor, we'll start with a single cognition actor, to um, learn how to make sense of its local environment, its so-called Umwelt. And making sense uh, implies, at a, at a minimum, to be able to uh, predict incoming uh, sensations. So it needs to learn to predict. So what will be given to a cognition actor? Well, a, uh, there'll be a history of uh, sensations uh, broken into discrete uh, units of time. So, time n minus 3 and n minus 2, n minus 1, time n, which is the, the, the present moment. So these would be remembered observations. And then what we want to get out of this is the ability to um, predict the next incoming set of sensations at time uh, t equals n plus 1, n plus 2. And for this, to be able to predict uh, future observations, we need some kind of predictor function that is learned from the remembered uh, observation. Now, this predictive capability can be built in two very general ways. One is from statistics, uh, so doing pattern analysis and, and being able to predict what's most probable, which is the standard uh, current machine learning uh, approach. Or we could predict from an understanding of uh, the observations by developing a causal model uh, of these uh, of what uh, 
produce these sensations and from this understanding uh, predict what rationally should be observed next. So this is all about sense making. And now what is sense making? How do I understand sense making? Um, well, to rationally predict incoming sensory inputs, uh, one must make sense of them. That's what making sense means to me. Um, and to make sense of sensory inputs means to derive meaningful experiences from them. It's not just data. It's not just pieces of data. It's a, they must be meaningful experiences. And by experience, uh, I mean uh, a conceptualization of the sensations and a unification of them in time and space. So making sense of these inputs will mean to produce meaningful experiences that are conceptualizations and unifications of the sensations. Now, an experience is meaningful if it is underwritten by a causal model. So the experience is, uh, is, uh, is perceived as the consequences of a a uh, latent generative model, a uh, generative process that we have modeled. And I want meaning to be inherent to the agent, and that only happens if the agent is truly autonomous, and if uh, this meaning is grounded in the survival imperative, as uh, discussed earlier. So how does experiencing work? How can that be put into computer code? Surprisingly, for this, we refer to the philosophy of Immanuel Kant. Immanuel Kant took an, a reverse engineering approach, um, asking himself, what must entities do to achieve experience? This is akin to the um, uh, free energy principles high road, which can be paraphrased as, what must organisms do to maintain their existence? So Immanuel Kant uh, tried to reverse engineer um, uh, cognition, um, asking himself, what's the minimal cognitive apparatus needed by an entity to have experiences? And, and that he, he, he documented in his uh, Critique of Pure Reason. Just a, a, a little parenthesis, um, the, the meaning of, of the title Critique of Pure Reason is not what I thought it was. Um, it actually translates more closely to uh, the case for a priori cognition. Uh, critique is, is a legal term, is where you make your case. And pure reason, uh, we translate nowadays as a priori cognition. So um, his work wanted to establish what must happen to create an experience that's coherent, that is unified in time and space, um, and to uh, reverse engineer cognition as a system that is both complete and essential, that is minimal. Okay, so uh, let's let's. Um, I'm going to try to give you the uh, uh, posted uh, postage stamp uh, version of uh, Immanuel Kant's uh, theory, uh, focusing on his synthetic unity of apperception. Well, first of all. There's the real world, which is outside of our direct experience. Uh, it's the noumena. It's forever hidden from us um, as an as-is uh, uh, reality. But we do. Uh, it, it, it impinges on our sensorium, and then so we have uh, a number of intuitions: sight, sound, touch, smell, um, that are initially uh, uh, separate, and, and then we need to. Uh, network them, connect them, both in time and in space. Uh, in space um, uh, is, is, is the sound and, 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 and the sight uh, describing a single thing. Um, uh, is one thing uh, behind or uh, inside another? Um, and in time, is this happening before, after uh, something else? And, and, and then at, at a higher level, um, meaning is given to these uh, networked intuitions, sensations uh, via concepts and, and judgments, rules, uh, which are generalizations as to 
what can and cannot be. Um, and this is what we experience. Now, it, it turns out that a, con a synthetic unity of apperception is um, a blueprint for automating a sense making. Um, and, and it's kind of uh, interesting, I think, that uh, 18th century philosophy would be uh, relevant to uh, 21st century uh, technology development. And this is what happened and, 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 and was published uh, by Richard Evans and, and all in the paper, Making Sense of Sensory Input, where um, they developed uh, the apperception engine. They took um, Kant's synthetic unity of apperception as software requirements and uh, successfully implemented uh, them into a piece of software, the apperception engine, and applied it to a, a number of uh, exercises um, uh, and where um, they, they got a very good result. So the apperception engine is in um, uh, an instance of machine learning. It's unsupervised machine learning, and it operates on very small data sets. Um, and generates uh, human-readable re uh, generative models. And when I read the paper, I realized, well, that's exactly uh, what my robot uh, needed. So what does an apperception engine do? Well, given uh, a, a, a sequence of observed uh, states, it uh, finds a generative model that can recreate past states, but most importantly, predict uh, future uh, states. And a state is defined as a um, set of simultaneous uh, observations, uh, sensations, intuitions. So an apperception engine searches for a causal theory that can uh, recreate observations. I say searches because this causal theory uh, is not determined by the observations. Um, it, it has to be found, it has to be discovered. But once it is found, then it can be validated against the observations and, say, and see if it can recreate them and augment them uh, into the future, as well as into the past. So what, what is a causal theory? A causal theory is, is a logic program that has a number of components. Um, there, in the causal theory, there will be uh, the objects and the predicates from the observed uh, uh, relations. So from the observations, we can extract what objects were observed and what properties of these objects were observed, and maybe what relationships of these, ob these objects were observed. That's the start. Then we have latent object types, objects and predicates. So we may want to imagine, the causal theory imagines uh, hidden objects, maybe hidden types of objects and maybe hidden uh, properties and relationships between uh, objects, uh, latent meaning unobserved. And given both the observed and unobserved um, uh, objects and, 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 and predicates, it derives rules. First of all, constraints on those predicates, what's permissible. So for example, uh, being in front of cannot, uh, A cannot be in front of B and at the same time B uh, and at the same time behind B. So an object cannot be in front of another and behind it. So there are constraints on predicates. And then there are rules that uh, apply to any simultaneous sets of observations. But what uh, they uh, must conform to. Then there are rules that given a state will infer the next state. And then maybe some initial state from which we can uh, uh, run uh, the causal theory. So what makes a causal theory unified? Well, first of all, it needs to be unified in order to make sense of the observation. There are various dimensions. So. If a causal theory involves a number of objects, all these objects must be directly or indirectly related. There's no object that just floats in space totally independent of the other objects. So they must all be related. Um, so they're, they're spatially unified. 
all predicates that make up the uh, causal theory, like uh, on, off, behind, and in front, they must be uh, constrained so that, um, for example, in front cannot be at the same time as behind, or that a, a light cannot be both turned on and turned off. So there's there's some restrictions on uh, the, the predicates, and that creates conceptual uh, unity. And then the static unity, where all simultaneous relations must satisfy the static rules, and temporal unity, where all the states must be <clears throat> sequenced by ca uh, causal rules. We'll see examples. So let's start with a, an example here <clears throat> of a set of observations. What we are observing are two lights. Uh, and the lights can either be uh, at any discrete uh, moment in time, either on or off. So here we have uh, a sequence of uh, uh, observations. Uh, and, and one moment in time, uh, the first light was off and the second light was on. <clears throat> then the first light was on, the second light was off. <clears throat> then both were on, etc. And I put the gray bars there um, to show that maybe the observations are incomplete. So at one stage, we can only see the second light. Or there may be other lights or other objects that we do not see, but that's what we observe. So you feed these observations <clears throat> um, in discrete time into the app perception engine. And the app perception engine searches for a causal theory that, um, when applied to an initial condition, let's say that. Uh, uh, light A is off and light B is on, it will, it will create a, a trace of uh, recreated observations that um, cover is a superset matches the initial observations. And if it, this happens, then our causal theory is a good one. Now, <clears throat> the causal theory may uh, infer uh, the existence of hidden objects, hidden relations, and whatnot. It may actually need to. Oh, so here's a an example of a causal theory that is generated by my own implementation of the app perception engine, because I, I re-implemented the uh, the app perception engine as described in the paper by uh, Richard Evans and all. And um, I ran it on. This, this set of observations about lights on uh, two lights, uh, one on, one off at any point in time. And it came up with, it found a result. <clears throat> it found the result in uh, 64 seconds. There is a perfect match. And it, um, it actually invented a relationship, which it called PRED1, um, which we can, let's, let's imagine that it actually means connects to. And it found a static rule and a causal rule. Uh, it said that a, a light is on at, at any moment in time. A light is on if a light that connects to it is off. And it found a causal rule that said um, a, a light turns off if it uh, connects to another light that was also off. So that's how... Uh, the, the lights uh, change over time, their status are on and off. And it came up with initial conditions that said that, well, A connects to, first of all, that there's an object one, a light called object one that we don't see, but is there, we, we imagine is there, that A connects to it, uh, the light object one connects to B, and the light B connects to object one. So that's the causal rule that it discovered. Now, if we uh, run uh, this causal rule, produce a trace. And as you can see, the trace matches the observation. It adds an, a, a new object. So uh, the coverage being uh, excellent, uh, being perfect in this case, and our causal theory is a good one. It's actually a perfect one. It's not, it's not necessarily the only one, though. So is this causal theory unified? 
So going back to uh, Dr. Kant's uh, requirement of synthetic uh, unity of apperception, not every causal theory will do, though it may predict correctly, it may not be meaningful unless it is unified. Well, is it, we've saw the four dimensions, the four dimensions of unification, is it spatially, spatially unified? Well, all our objects are connected directly or indirectly to each other. That's good. So we have spatial unification. Do we have conceptual unification? So we have this new predicate. We have two predicates, right? Uh, pred one, which we uh, uh, translate to connects to, and then the predicate that says uh, whether the light is on or off. Well, we have a constraint that says that um, a, a light can only be connected to one other light. So pred one has a constraint on it that says it, uh, it, it's it's exclusive, so an object cannot have pred one to two objects. It cannot connect to two objects. That's a constraint that was discovered and part of the causal theory, and also uh, uh, implicitly um, a uh, the uh, on uh, relation of the predicate has the value on or off, and it cannot be both at the same time. So it's conceptually unified. Is it statically unified? Are, are the rules of static rules obeyed? Well, uh, for example, the static rule would say that uh, given that B, B uh, connects uh, to A, if B is off, then A must be on. So if you look at any uh, place where B is off, A is going to be on. And you could do that for uh, every uh, other uh, light and relationships between lights. So they, they all obey the static rule and the causal rule says uh, in for example here that if b connects to a then if a was off then b must turn off so if you look at uh, b let's say here b was off um yeah uh, if i'm sorry if uh, b connects to a and yes and if A was off, B must be off. So if A was off, B becomes off the next step. So that's correct as well. So statistically, uh, we are true. And temporarily, we are true. We are unified. And of course, that uh, we get a thumbs up from uh, Dr. Kant. Our causal theory is unified. And thus, makes it makes sense of the observations of the sensory inputs. Now, it's a, no accident uh, that um, uh, Kant would be would figure in an active inference project. There is a link uh, between active inference and Kant, and it runs through uh, the celebrated nineteenth-century uh, German engineer Hermann von Helmholtz. He was a disciple of Kant. And he developed the theory of uh, visual perception that op operationalized Kant's epistemology, and in fact, it anticipates predictive processing. Uh, in 1995, uh, Peter Dayen and uh, Jeff Hinton uh, developed the Helmholtz machine, named as in his honor. Um, and it is a type of artificial neural network that's trained to create a generative model uh, from an original set of data, and it can account for the hidden structure of the data. So there's a, a, as you see, there's a, there's a, a link, which is uh, discussed and elaborated in this paper, which is very, a very interesting paper. All right, so close parentheses. So we've looked at the apperception engine uh, from the perspective of Kant's uh, philosophy. So uh, now let's look at it through the lens of machine learning. Um, we, uh, the observations that constitute a training set, it's a very small one. And the apprehension engine is uh, the uh, learning algorithm. And what is learned, the output is a causal theory. Um, so the, the, the learning process is, uh, is unsupervised logical inferencing. And the, um, the output is a human readable logic program. 
So we see here that there's there's some uh, profound differences with uh, uh, the more popular form of machine learning in that the training set is really small, um, in that uh, the uh, the product of uh, the the learning the uh, is actually a uh, human readable artifact in this case a logic program. So this is the training set um, uh, as, as inputted, uh, lights, LEDA turned off uh, at uh, time one, B turned on at time one, A turned on at time two, B turned off at time two, et cetera, et cetera. So that's the training set. And you feed this into the um, uh, obsession, uh, perception engine's algorithm, and out comes a uh, causal uh, theory. So in, in, in a little bit more details, uh, what the uh, algorithm is and does. First, it extracts um, the uh, observed object, extent objects, the object types and predicates from the observations. So we have on, we have object A, object B, uh, we have LED as an object type. So that's all part of the observations and that becomes part of the uh, extent vocabulary. Then uh, the application engine imagines uh, unobserved objects, types and, and uh, predicates uh, for the relationships and properties. And that becomes a latent vocabulary. So there's a, a, a step of imagination. Then using the combined vocabulary, you know, the, both the extent and, and, and latent vocabulary combined, it looks for a uh, unified causal theory, a set of constraints, rules, and initial conditions that uh, obey the, um, the uh, rules of um, the constraints of uh, synthetic uh, unity of apperception. Um, once it has this causal theory and with initial conditions, it applies the uh, causal theory to these conditions and produces a trace. Uh, it recreates observations, if you want, and, and augments them and, and extends them to the future. Uh, now it, it looks at this trace and compares it with the initial observations for coverage and decides if this is a good causal theory or not. Then it also looks at the causal theory complexity, how many rules, how complex are the rules, et cetera, and um, measures for complexity. So if we have a choice between two, uh, causal theories uh, of equivalent coverage, um, the app perception engine will uh, uh, select the least complex one using Occam's razor. Now, if you look at this algorithm, you'll see that the, 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 the boxes in green are um, not uh, deterministic. That's, this is where search happens. We can posit different kinds of objects. We can find different kinds of rules. So this, this, was, this is where search uh, happens. Now, app perception is implemented using logic inference. Actually, it uses uh, three forms of logic inference. There's the one that we're more familiar with, which is uh, deduction, where given rules and causes, we, we infer the effects. Then there's uh, induction, where given causes and effect, we look for the rules. This is what science does, right? Looking for rules that would account for uh, effects given the causes. Then there's abduction where given the rules and given what we observe the effects, we're looking for the causes. In this case, we're looking for the latent objects, the latent relationships between these objects. And then you can combine both abduction and induction where you're given effects, essentially observations, and you're looking for both causes and rules, which is what the app perception engine does. And this is where in the, um, in the algorithm, uh, these kinds of inferences uh, are at play. So positing latent objects, that's that's a form of abduction, uh, imagining causes, finding the rules, well, that's clearly a, a, a form of induction, and then applying the rules to uh, a, a, of a causal theory to um, uh, some initial conditions to create a trace, well, that's, that's deduction. We have the causes, the initial conditions, we have the rules, causal theory, and then we produce a trace, the effects. And so that's that's deduction. So the app perception engine uses all forms of uh, logical inference. 
And and now just a reminder that um, the output of the uh, apperception engine, that is what is learned, is actually human readable. Uh, you may want to compare that to a, a, a large um, array of floating points uh, produced by um, traditional, the more uh, popular form of machine learning nowadays. So here, this is what's actually produced by the apperception engine as it runs on a set of observations. It produces um, a logic program that is human readable. The only, the only when you look at it, the only thing you need to to kind of guess is what does the what what is meant by pred one. And if you think, well, maybe it means connects to maybe the lights are connected underneath uh, a board out of sight of um, of uh, the observer. But finding a unified causal theory is hard. So we have to uh, guess what the latent objects and predicates are. What, what are the hidden uh, lights? What are the hidden relationships between lights? And we have to discover what constraints might apply on the predicates. Um, and what are the initial conditions from which we want to recreate a trace? Uh, what are the static rules that apply to uh, simultaneous observations? And then what are the causal rules that given uh, uh, observations at time t, uh, will uh, predict observations at time uh, t plus one. This, this is hard. As a matter of fact, it's non-polynomially -polyno hard. Uh, the search space grows exponentially with the size of the input, which is the, 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 the size of the uh, extent, extent and latent vocabularies. And the, the, so just like in chess, you can't uh, predict uh, to the end uh, the consequence of a move because of common neural explosion. Uh, with the app perception engine, you cannot systematically traverse the entire space of possible causal theories to find a good one because it's impossibly large. So the job of the app perception engine is to find a causal theory in a ridiculously large haystack. How to do this? Uh, in my implementation, I follow the, uh, the, the, the recommendations in, in, uh, and, and, and I follow also the implementation in uh, Richard Evans' uh, paper by breaking the search space into uh, chunks. First, I, uh, there's a region, and the region says, um, so how many latent object types, objects, and predicates will we allow? So what is the limit of imagination of the um, cognition actors that is trying to uh, apperceive a causal theory. What are the limits of its imagination? And within that region um, of bounded imagination, um, we uh, carve it into templates where we say, okay, we're going to use these latent objects, types, these latent objects. And uh, so basically what vocabulary, specific vocabulary we're going to be using uh, we're going to use object one, we're going to use object uh, pred one on top of the uh, observed on uh, predicate and observed uh, A and B lights. And uh, we're going to set the maximum complexity on the rules and see if within uh, we can find causal theories that fit this template. So this is a carving up of the search space. And having broken the search space into uh, regions and templates, uh, we have scopes in which to apply heuristics. Now, why heuristics? Because the systematic traversal in, uh, cannot be done in reasonable time. There's just too many uh, candidate uh, causal theories to, to look at, to find a good one. So we use heuristics. We, we, find, we, we, we find ways of maybe getting to a good solution faster at the risk of missing it, but at least uh, will have an answer or no answer in a reasonable amount of time. And there's a number of, of heuristics that uh, I have implemented in, in my implementation of the app perception engine. Well, there's time boxing. At some point, you'd spend no more than this amount of time looking into uh, a region or in, into a template. Uh, there's multitasking. Well, the problem is actually, as they say, embarrassingly parallel. You can explore multiple regions and multiple templates in parallel. And so make good use of uh, a multi-core uh, computer. Uh, you want to make sure you don't repeat yourself. So you don't want to uh, traverse the same region uh, twice or look at the same causal theory twice. 
you want to satisfy. You maybe uh, a good enough theory is just fine. We don't want to look for the perfect one necessarily. We may not have time. Um, you want to fail early. If you're in a region where nothing good is found, you may want to leave it uh, quite quickly at the risk of maybe not finding the, a good one that is just over the horizon, but you want to be impatient. You want to throw the dice. You may want to uh, kind of mix it up so that every time you run the app perception engine on the same problem, uh, you may find a solution, a, a, a different solution first. Um, you want to uh, go for the simpler solution first. You may not want to try everything, just sample some. You want to start with the, the, the easiest uh, uh, part of the, the search space first, be judicious and so forth and so on. And most importantly, be selective. So uh, reject any uh, causal theory that would fail the, the, the constraints of unity of apperception. With all these in place, uh, the uh, running uh, um, my implementation of the apperception engine uh, gives pretty good results. So here I, I did a run. This is not cherry picked. I said, decided to do one uh, series of seven runs uh, and uh, collect the data and uh, show it. And in, in this run, I set up the app precision engine to only accept a perfect causal theory, one that would uh, produce a, a trace that totally covers the observation. So, and I did seven runs. Uh, the first one succeeded, found it in four seconds. Uh, the second one, it took 102 seconds. So there's there's some randomization in, in the order in which things are searched. Is luck is involved, as I said. Um, the third one, one second, that was, that was pretty cool. The, the, the fourth one, well, took 204 seconds. And then 96, 12, 99. So, uh, quite a, a good distribution here. Now I said, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna run the app perception engine again on the same, uh, training set that, uh, I showed earlier, those two lights. But this time I said, um, I'm, I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna accept the theory that has at least uh, that has at least 80, that has 85 percent or more coverage so it it, it predicts it, it it recreates the 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 observations well enough but not perfectly and i uh time boxed it to 30 seconds so you have 30 seconds to find it go um the first run uh, it find a, a a causal theory with 75 percent uh accuracy uh immediately then the same accuracy, same coverage, 10 seconds, 11 seconds, it hit 80, uh, 29 seconds, it, it found a, a perfect one. Then 11, it found 87% coverage and stopped right there. That's good enough. 75, again, 100% is the first one it found above 85 in 18 seconds and 75% zero seconds. So a, a good distribution again. So we're, we're getting into a reasonable times. We're not talking about hours here. We're talking about seconds. And I'm, I'm hoping to um, do further optimizations and bring it down to something even smaller so that a cognition actor can say, uh, uh, I want to make sense of these observations, uh, query the apperception engine and, and get an answer, a causal theory within uh, maybe a, a couple of seconds. That's my hope. Now, Something interesting here. It so happens that what makes it hard for the app perception engine to find a good causal theory is formally equivalent to what makes cognitive science as a whole hard. And that's this paper here makes the case uh, and proves the case uh, quite cogently. Um, so uh, cognitive science wants to find models, functions, or algorithms that. Um, uh, explain, account for um, situated behaviors. So you, you feed in, uh, you feed into this, this, the cognitive science machine, um, pairs of uh, situations and behaviors, and you want to come out of it, a, a model, an explanation, a, a, a function or an algorithm that uh, accounts for it. Well, the, the, the paper makes the case that if, if if the explanation is is to be bounded in size, then the the the, the problem is computable, but is not tractable in the sense meaning that it's combinatorially explosive. But once you have a solution, it is uh, computable and tractable to verify 
that the solution is good, that, that it, it accounts for the, um, the, uh, the data that you're trying to understand. Well, this is, this is equivalent, formally equivalent to what the app perception engine is doing. Um, my implementation was done in Prologue. Uh, I will not go into the details. It's about a thousand lines of Prologue. I'll just say that Prologue is a programming language uh, that uses uh, deductive inference as its model of computation with backtracking. Um, so essentially, it searches it searches for a solution and will uh, backtrack if it took the wrong um, branch, if you want, if, and 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 will look for a, a different way of satisfying a a, a line uh, of the program. Um, so let's just say that it it makes traversing a search space. Uh, it gives it, it, we get traversing a search space for free when we program in Prolog. I won't go into any more details, but you can see some Prolog code here, and it's um, it, the fun thing is that um, a, 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 a Prolog program is akin to uh, a logical description of the problem it's trying to solve. I think it's very cool, and. Uh, Prolog environment was augmented by uh, something called constraint handling rules, which is an extension to Prolog that adds abductive reasoning. So basically, in the program, you can say, assume this is true until proven otherwise. And the, uh, the, uh, the, the rules, uh, the CHR rules, um, are there to uh, verify if it can be proven otherwise. So, um, Again, I'm not asking you to understand this code at all, but I want you to realize that this code is the code that actually uh, executes a causal theory, um, both the static and causal rules to build traces. It is that small, it's, it's very powerful. So combining Prolog and uh, CHR, um, I found extraordinarily uh, powerful. I'm very excited about it, but I'm a programmer. Next steps, well, next steps, now that we've uh, solved uh, individual learning uh, by cognitive uh, actors, well, I want to move to uh, beliefs from uh, from uh, sensations and to policies to validate or eliminate beliefs. Um, a lot of these uh, beliefs actually fall out of our perception. Latent objects and latent relationships and properties are can be considered by, as beliefs. And then there are other kinds of beliefs that can be uh, obtained from uh, what's been perceived. Um, there'll be introspective beliefs uh, that uh, uh, communicate um, how the cognitive cognition actor is doing in terms of competence, predictionary rates, um, how well uh, its um, it, its app perception is doing is uh, and uh, whether it is uh, uh, engaging with other cognition actors is it relevant? I will have feelings which will provide normativity to these beliefs. So if uh, uh, feelings are uh, signals of uh, risk to homeostasis, uh, loss of resources, physical damage, uh, too many prediction errors, so that's anger, pain, and fear. Uh, and uh, feelings will taint beliefs over time. And uh, tainted beliefs, and norm good beliefs, bad beliefs, will uh, want to be eliminated or validated through policies um, that will be synthesized by the cognition actor. And each cognition actor will uh, uh, emit, uh, make available to others um, its API what what predictions can be made about the beliefs of this cognition actor, what actions uh, are available to others to be uh, uh, asked of the connection, cognition actor. And then uh, as cognition actors uh, uh, connect to one another, uh, as the uh, cognition actors form the umwelt of other cognition actors, then uh, the uh, cognition actor will be able to predict the beliefs of others, will be able to uh, compose uh, policies made out of actions that are implemented by other cognition actors, and eventually um, we'll have a society of mind, which is a, a bunch of intersecting uh, umwelts. So um, that's uh, it. Um, so I, I see what uh, 
the society of mind is a complex system uh, of collective theorizers. And I'm going to try going further with this project to answer the question if uh, a collective of theorizers can self-organize to actively sustain itself. So thank you uh, to the Active Inference Institute for inviting me to present and for providing a home for this project and for the constant support and encouragement. I'll see you later on Discord. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, JF. Just to conclude the session, I'll, I'll read two questions and let's maybe address them in an upcoming robotics and embodied meeting. So if you're excited about this project, certainly we all are, and about symbolic active inference, join the Discord and participate in the robotics and embody. But I'll drop these two questions from David Williams in the chat who wrote, one, how important is conducting this work in real world versus simulation? And two, what tools or components are missing in the robotics toolkit to make this research e easier and better? I know those are things that you have a lot of thoughts on, so I'll look forward to uh, discussing with you more. Thank you, JF. Thank you. Peace. All right. See you. And it's a great segue from collective behavior in surprise minimizing agents to collective behavior in surprise minimizing agents, <laughs> I guess. Welcome, Connor. Hey, sorry, I just turned on my audio, so I just heard the last thing you said. Yeah. Hey. 